thank you for joining us. And we thank um, Erica, Kristen, and Kylie. We have three people um, joining us today, and they all work um, for what I used to always call the USDA lab, but I think its official name is the National Center for Agricultural Utilization Research. You guys can correct me if I got that wrong. But Erica and Kylie are both um, lab techs there, and Kristen is a postdoc research associate. And so they will be sharing a little bit about what they do and um, their path to their career. So we'll start with Erica today. Thank you, Erica, for being on. Hello, wow, I'm super excited to be here today. Um, I have never done uh, outreach virtually before. I've had a lot of experience doing uh, outreach with uh, all sorts of ages of uh, young people, but never online. So <laughs> this is brand new for me, super exciting. I uh, hope it goes well. Um, I live in rural central Illinois, out in the country. Uh, my internet is not awesome. So uh, if I cut out suddenly, I apologize, and one of my two coworkers will, will take over for me, and uh, um, they, I'm sure they have fascinating stories to tell as well. Um, uh, just a little bit about myself. I am uh, 44 years old. I am a mother of five, and um, I've been working at the ag, I call it the ag lab um, for, 20 plus years. Uh, I love my job. Um, I miss not being in the lab all the time. Right now we're working mostly from home, um, doing a whole bunch of uh, paperwork that we normally shove to the side and um, I'll wait till we have time to do it. And now's the time to do it because we're uh, not, uh, not allowed to spend very much time in the laboratory. Um, I am going to share my screen with you so you can see some pictures as I talk to you a little bit of more about what I do and uh, how I got into science. Okay, nod your head if you see a picture of a caterpillar. I can only, I can only see Kylie's face. So now I'm looking at you, Kylie. You're going to have to help me so you, uh, you know that. So I know that I'm doing things right. Okay, so. Um, let's see, uh, what, what do I do? How did I get here? Um, so first off, uh, when we were talking before we got started and uh, Kristen said that she wasn't one of those people who always knew that they wanted to be a scientist, um, that she kind of stumbled into it and, um, uh, and ended up loving it. Um, I have a different story. I think that I am one of those people that has, was born to be a scientist. Uh, my dad loves to tell the story about when, you know, when I was a little girl and I was a little girl who was always bringing in insects uh, for my mom to see and she didn't like that very much. <laughs> She's not an insect person, but um, so I, I was definitely the little kid that was outside um, you know, loving to, to look at things in nature up close. Um, uh, one of my hobbies um, is uh, nature photography, and I love uh, insect photography. I, I will say, and this is, this is to encourage you guys, and this part of what I want to do today is to encourage you guys to be um, scientists where you are with what you have. Um, I love photography and I love nature photography. I um, don't have professional photography equipment. <laughs> I don't have the money for professional photography equipment. So all the pictures that you're gonna see um, in this presentation were taken with just a basic point and shoot camera. It takes a lot more patience, I think, to get good pictures. You have to take a lot more pictures to get good pictures with inexpensive equipment, but you definitely can take good pictures with, with uh, cameras that are not expensive. Um, so I just chose this, this opening photograph because it's one of my uh, favorite photographs from the house that I live in now. Uh, this is a... Um, black swallowtail caterpillar on dill. So I have, we have a couple different garden areas 
uh, where I live. One is a, a herb garden and the other is a vegetable garden. And so this, I found this guy uh, munching away in our herb garden. Um, I love that picture. Um, okay, so just as an opener about me. So like I, I have always known that I was interested in science. I didn't really know though about what I could do as a scientist, what kind of jobs were available for people who were interested in science. I, I, I thought uh, when I was younger that I was more interested in plants than insects. I, I mean, I had a fascination with insects, but when, when I first started thinking about getting a job in science, I was thinking plants. Um, uh, maybe plant breeding or plant, uh, I mean, or working in a greenhouse even. Um, so I, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I definitely knew that I was interested in science. Um, I ended up in uh, entomology, the study of insects, um, just by chance. So that, that aspect of it, I did end up by chance. I was required to do a job shadow experience when I was in high school, and uh, my parents were friends with a scientist um, who had, was an entomologist, worked with insects, and so I asked him to job shadow um, when I was in high school, and that's when I discovered um, scientific research in the area of um, insect um, control. So, so trying to find ways to control the insect pests in our life. Uh, in the laboratory that I work, we are trying to find alternatives to chemical insecticides. Um, there, that could take lots of pathways. So ways that you can control insects without uh, chemicals could be um, trying to improve the conditions for beneficial insects. So those that are insects that eat other insects. So you could be trying to, to uh, create a good environment for beneficial insects. Um, spraying chemicals does not provide a good environment for beneficial insects. So that's one reason not to use chemical uh, uh, pesticides. Um, but the area that I work in more is uh, using um, the diseases that insects get against them to, to kill them. So just like we get viruses, bacteria, funguses, and some of those bacteria, funguses, and viruses are harmful enough to us that they can kill us, there are also diseases that insects get that can kill them. Now, now insects are so different from us that the diseases that they get are not harmful to us. Their, their body systems are so different that, that they just, there's, there's no worry about uh, these diseases going from the insects to people or even, or even other mammals or um, uh, not closely related animals. Um, so here we have um, yeah, an example of a fungus that kills Uh, insects. It's called metarhizium. Um, so in my job, I work with both the microbes that kill the insects. So I'm working with petri plates. Also work with the um, the insect pests that these. So um, what? that I have worked with uh, in a, a larvae of beetles are called grubs. So this is a Japanese beetle grub. On the right, you see a healthy looking grub. And on the left is a grub that was killed by fungus. Here's just a closer picture of the two. So we got Japanese beetle grub and one that was killed by fungus. The green, like the fuzzy-ish green and white on there, that's the fungus. This fungus also controls the adult stage of the beetle. And Japanese beetles are kind of a nightmare pest uh, locally right now. Uh, they're uh, um, an exotic invasive pest. 
Um, so the, the, the grubs eat uh, plant roots and can harm the plant that way, and the adults eat the top part of the plants and can harm the plants that way. So um, both of those life stages are pest stages. That's not the case with all insects. Some insects, only the larval stage is the pest and the adults aren't, or vice versa. Oh, and just an even closer picture, like I said, the white and green on there is the fungus. Okay, so um, I wanted to, that, that's just a kind of a basic idea of what we're doing at the lab um, in our laboratory. So we're working with these disease organisms and trying to uh, find ways that farmers can actually practically use these diseases as um, control agents. Um, but I wanted to transition this a little bit to the idea that anybody can be a scientist anywhere that you are. Um, science is just about being curious about the world around you. It's about asking questions about the world around you. It's trying to mentally answer those questions about the world around you and then trying to find, find the real answer to your questions, the, the, find the facts that, that answer that question. Um, so in this picture here, the bottom insect right there is that Japanese beetle that I was telling you about before. So the Japanese beetle, it's a pest, um, it, it's a pest, like you, it'll eat your grass roots and make the grass in your yard die. It'll eat your ornamental plants. Um, I have a huge issue with, so in my yard, it likes to eat the, um, the petals off of my flowers that I like to grow. So I've got, um, so here, this picture is, um, purple coneflower, so like I love I love taking pictures like this, but I want the I want the flower to look pretty. So if the, the petals are all chewed by the Japanese beetle, it makes me mad. Anyway, so it also they also like to eat my sunflowers, eat the petals right off. But anyway, Japanese beetle is a giant pain. Um, but this year in my yard, we've been seeing tons of this top beetle. So it's much larger, it buzzes around. My kids always think they're bee, like bumblebees, so they're always freaked out. Um, but th then we figured out, you know, it's not a, it's not a bee, it's, not, it's a kind of beetle. But I, this is not a beetle that I have encountered in the research that I have done. And so it, it created a ton of questions in my mind. Like, what is it? Why are there so many in my yard right now? Is it, is it like the Japanese beetle going to cause me, you know, to cry because it's eating all my pretty plants? Um, so I have these questions in my mind. So when you're outside in your world, like if you look close at things, you can come up with questions in your mind. Um, so I pulled that large beetle, so the one that I actually caught, so the one that you, took, that you saw that photograph of, I actually caught it uh, by pulling it off of a sunflower. Um, on this sunflower, you can see a couple smaller beetles. Those beetles are um, uh, northern corn rootworm beetles. But right now we're surrounded by uh, corn at my house. Every other year it's corn, every other year it's soybeans. This year it's corn. So I know on corn years that I am going to get some rootworm beetles on, on my plants. So like I said, like you look at this picture and you see a sunflower, but if you look closely at this picture, just like if you look closely at the things in your world, you're going to see things. And you just need to let those things that you see, those, those things that normally people just overlook, you need to let them uh, create questions in your mind. So, uh, something I observed about this, these large beetles, I saw them in two, concentrated in two areas in my yard. The first area I saw them concentrated was around my sunflowers. So were they a pest of sunflowers? Maybe. Uh, the other area I saw them concentrated, like buzzing around like crazy, was my vegetable garden area. Um, so this is a picture of my vegetable garden. Um, 
it's got this section has kale, cabbage, um, squash, and right there in the middle is the marigold plant. So does this beetle have something to do with one of those plants? Uh, I don't know. I have to figure that out. Uh, my kale has tons of feeding damage. What's that all about? Now, I know, like, it, that would be a question you would have, but I know because of the research that I have done in the past that there are three main pests of kale, and so kale, cabbage, broccoli, cauliflower, they're all related, and so I know that there's three uh, main pests of this crop, and if, if I look at, if I look closer at this crop and I can see evidence of those three pests, then that probably tells me that that's what's causing that damage, not these beetles. So I'm looking closer at my kale. You can see right in the middle of this picture, those two yellow dots. I know that those two yellow dots are um, imported cabbage worm eggs. Uh, now, if you didn't know what those two yellow dots are, you could Google it and keep, and, and that's what I do. If I don't know, Something that's insect related. I love the I love our our ability to look up things online now. Like I wish I wish that like we had uh, encyclopedias when I was a kid. <laughs> Whenever I had questions about my world as a kid, my mom would send me to the encyclopedias. That was my or we would go to the library. I mean that was the way that we got answers to things. Now you can get answers it's so easy. So those are eggs. Uh, in the middle, well, so to the left and in the middle of this picture is the is the real culprit to those holes in my kale. So that's the imported cabbage worm larvae. Um, the, the adult stage is actually a white butterfly. So they're really pretty. I've, I've seen, I've definitely seen the butterflies flying around too. Um, the butterflies lay those yellow eggs, which hatch in the larvae, which eat tons of holes in my kale. Um, now, I also know some um, non-chemical control um, that I could use on my kale plants. I just didn't get to it this year. So um, we got a good har we got a good harvest out of the kale before all this damage happened. Um, if I wanted to get a second harvest, I would have needed to apply something because now the plants are covered. Okay, this is something else that I found when I was looking at my kale. This is an example of a beneficial insect. So if I had applied uh, chemical control to my kale, I wouldn't be seeing this. Um, there's a tiny wasp that lays its eggs on the larvae of the imported cabbage worm and cabbage looper and other larval uh, caterpillar pests. And um, the, the the, Im the immature stage, the larval stage of that wasp uh, grows inside the caterpillar, essentially consuming it, and then they burst out uh, the caterpillar, and um, the, all of these yellow cylinders are the uh, pupae of the wasp, and the tiny little wasp will get, tiny little wasp that will come out and start the cycle over again. I found tons of these um, evidence of, of these parasitic wasps um, on my kale plants, probably because there was such a large population of um, uh, larvae <laughs> on my plants. So that's good. I'm encouraging beneficials. Okay, so <laughs> why am I showing you a picture of dirt? Um, as I, so I, I, I didn't, so my, my current knowledge didn't answer the question that I had about that large beetle. So remember my question was, does it eat um, sunflowers? Is it a pest of these other plants? I will say my squash looks good, so I don't think that that, that Mentally, I wasn't thinking that that was going to be the answer, but I still didn't have an answer as to why the beetles were so interested in those two areas of my yard. So I went on Google, and all I Googled was 
Large Green Beetle, Illinois. That's it. <laughs> like, it's like you just put in, you just put in a few descriptors when you're trying to figure out what an insect is. A lot of times, all you just do is put in a few descriptive elements about the insect and where you live, and you can get some answers. So it, sometimes things just pop right up. So sometimes you put in large green beetle, and that's the first thing you see is that beetle that you're um, interested in. Sometimes you have to look a little bit further, and you have to look in images and try and match up your, what you see to one of the images, and then click on the links for the image. Um, but in this case, I put in large green beetle, Illinois, and the first thing that came up was green June beetle. And the picture looks just like my beetle. And as I'm reading, oh, I do want to plug University of Illinois Extension because the, the source that all this information that I'm going to give you now comes from University of Illinois Extension. It's their home yard and garden pest newsletter. Um, and it's, the, it's the green June beetle ver, uh, episode or issue or whatever they, whatever they call it. Of, of their newsletter. And so as I'm reading about this green June beetle, there were two things that popped out at me that answered some of my questions. Um, one was um, that the larvae become numerous in large quantities of dead grass, such as piles of grass clippings or used animal bedding. Used animal bedding, guys. This picture that you're looking at right now is used animal bedding. So we have rabbits in our house. We put down straw under their cages. Uh, the waste accumulates on top of that straw. And then we take it all, like once it builds up a little bit, it's my kid's favorite job, they <laughs> shovel it out and they put it in, in our garden areas. So all of our, our, our the sunflowers are planted in, all, in used animal bedding. Our garden is planted in that. Um, so awesome fertilizer, by the way. Um, but uh, so the reason why they were concentrated in those two areas was because of what was on the ground, not the plants that were planted in, um, in that ground. Um, the other thing I saw in the, this, the, this newsletter was that the larvae create holes in the surface one and a half inch in diameter frequently with loose soil around them. And you'll see this in your uh, grass areas. And that is something that I saw earlier this spring. I had no idea what it was. And at the time I couldn't find the answer, but because I continue to ask questions and continue to be curious about the world around me, now I have answers, have an answer to that question from earlier this spring. So I just want you guys to know that you like, so you can be a scientist even if you're not in the scientific field. You can be a scientist even if you never have a job in science. Uh, Kylie and I, our job titles would not suggest scientists. So we're lab, we're, we're lab technicians. Lab technicians kind of sounds kind of, uh, you know, like it's not a very exciting job title. But I think that being a scientist is all about your what goes on in your mind. And uh, so Kylie and I, Kylie and I are scientists um, because we have that curiosity about the world around us. Um, anyway, uh, let's see. I think I have one more picture. Um, so this, so what I did today, I didn't do this just for you guys. Like, so, and I encourage my kids to do this as well. I have, I have kids aged range from three to um, 13. So they know, they know, like if you see something cool, come to mom and she will, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll explore this together. So um, th this beetle is an example of something that one of my kids found and pointed out to me. So we, we did an exploration together as to what this is. And speaking of kids, I have a kid that's constantly knocking at the door right now. Like I have no idea why. <laughs> this hasn't, I mean, it's happened to me in other meetings, but it's never happened to me when I was giving a presentation. So I do want to say that this job is pretty compatible with being a parent. Um, but this whole working from home has been um, 
difficult with kids. So, um, okay, so that's really all I have. Um, let me stop sharing my screen. Oh, and I see that I took almost a half an hour. I hope that it wasn't uh, a super boring half an hour. Um, I don't know if we want to um, have questions pertaining to what I just talked about, or if we want to let Kylie and Kristen talk first and then have questions. Do, do our um, the coordinators have any thoughts on that? I'm going to step away one second and tell my um, child to stop knocking on the door. Sure. I would say if anybody has questions about what Erica presented so far, um, why don't you go ahead and um, either unmute and ask that or you can put it in the chat. Otherwise, if you um, don't have any questions specifically about what she presented, we can go ahead and let um, Kristen or Kylie um, share and then we'll have time at the very end for questions for everybody as well. Um, as you guys are typing, so for the people who are typing, if anybody's typing, you know, something I didn't talk about was my educational background. Um, I do want to let you guys know that I started out my first two years at ICC, Illinois Central College, Community College. Um, for me, that was an awesome choice. Um, uh, it's definitely a cheaper choice than starting out at a four-year university. I don't really feel like I missed out on any opportunities. ICC has a lot of science uh, classes that you can take. I took, I think I took every science class that they had available there. I was able to get a lot of my um, uh, just general classes out of the way before I went to uh, the university. I took all of my math classes um, at uh, ICC. Um, and, and I feel like that really freed me up. So I, I transferred to the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana my junior year. And um, because I had taken so many classes at ICC, that really freed me up to really focus on those things that I was really interested in. So when I was at the university, I um, had more time to take and, and have more time to um, try to interact with professors and researchers that were in, in areas that I was interested in. Um, I did, I, and I can't stress mentor, mentorship enough. Um, I know that there's lots of scientists at the Ad Lab who really love interacting with young people and uh, are free to answer questions that you have about um, scientific, you know, how to get into science and or if you have any specific science questions, I love it when I get, you know, when people send me pictures of, of insects and say, you know, what is this? And, you know, what can I do about it? Or is it a problem? Um, so, so yeah, so ICC two years, University of Illinois two years. So I, I only, I only have, I only have a bachelor's degree, but so, I have a bachelor's degree in um, biology, so that that is my. So I don't even have any specific degree in entomology, but all of my work experience has been in that field. So um, I am, you know, definitely an entomologist uh, practically. Do we have any questions? So Erica, there is one question and one comment. Someone was just letting you know they have a rabbit at their house, um, and the oh. other. Is, um, is the fungus that killed the Japanese beetle available as a commercial product? I might have missed you saying that. Oh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I think it is. Um, I, I actually just got word that maybe that company has decided to stop making it, but um, the, the product, the commercial product, which I'm not endorsing at all, um, called Met 52. Um, I, I, it might not be, I, I guess, I heard word that it's maybe not available uh, currently. Uh, there are, so if you, if you, um, if you maybe type in biological insecticides, you can get some idea of what's available out there. Um, a lot of the research that we're doing is, is, is new, so that the, 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 the 
the stuff that we're working with isn't available yet. We're hoping that we can get it available. Um, cost is definitely an issue. Sure. Okay, thank you, Erica. Hi, my name is Kylie. Um, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to be presenting to you guys, talking about what I do and you know how I got here, where I am. Um, I'm going to share my screen because I made a PowerPoint. Um, all right, so I just wanted to start off um, kind of describing how I came to be working with um, insects, because if somebody told me that I would be working with insects, um, maybe even like five years ago, I probably would have laughed at them and told them there's no way that I would ever do that. Um, but basically it all started um, in my undergrad for my bachelor's. I started at a community college uh, back at home, and then I transferred to another community college. I'm a big advocate for community colleges because I think they're like smaller setting and it provides a lot of great opportunities for you to ask questions, which is really important for education. Um, so after I was done with community college, got my associates, I moved on to Illinois State University, which is just in central Illinois, if anyone isn't aware where that is. Um, and I studied general biology because when I transferred there, I had to claim um, a degree and I wasn't sure what I wanted to do at the time. Um, I knew I wanted to do something that was in science, but I wasn't too sure what the focus was going to be. So I just went with general biology. I had dreams of being like a veterinarian or an oncologist or a medical examiner. It switched like every couple of years, but um, I just decided to just do general to play it safe. And now I'm really glad that I did. You shouldn't have to claim um, a degree too early anyway, I think, in my opinion. Um, but here's a timeline of my education. So I graduated in May of 2016 with my bachelor's. And then shortly after that, I was kind of just left to wonder. I was like, all right, I graduated. Now I could really figure out what I want to do. And um, I didn't hear too much about opportunities for doing volunteer research during my undergrad um, career, but they're definitely out there. And it's a great resource because you gain a lot of experience and um, it really helps you determine what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Um, so after graduating, it was kind of a unique case. I still reached out to some professors and I asked them if they needed any um, volunteers in the lab just so I can, you know, gain some research experience and just kind of help out whenever they needed it. Um, thankfully, Dr. Ben Sad um, took me on as a volunteer postgraduate researcher. Um, and I actually was helping Kristen, uh, she's gonna be talking next. I was helping Kristen with some of her projects for her PhD. Um, so that was a lot of fun. And when I was doing that, I actually got bit by the research bug because I found out that I really liked doing research and decided I wanted to stick around. Um, I moved on to be a research laboratory assistant where I mostly helped Kristen with research, but I also did most of the rearing of crickets. Um, that was a study organism for Dr. Scott Sackalek's lab. And he collaborates with Dr. Ben Sad. Um, and then crickets are what Kristen worked with. And so I was just taking care of thousands of crickets and it seems really odd, but it was kind of fun. <laughs> um, and I liked it enough to actually stick around for a master's degree and um, Scott and them were both my advisors. And so I was working in the same lab as Kristen and I was also working with crickets and um, I had a really big interest in immunology as an undergrad. So I decided to stick with immunology and I studied the um, relationship between mating and immunology um, or the, in the immune system and crickets. Um, so that was my education and just kind of how I ended up where I am. And I'm really happy that I'm here. Um, I've been working with the USDA as a lab technician um, since late January. Uh, I'm working in Dr. Um, Jose Luis Ramirez's lab. Um, he works with mosquitoes and I'll tell you a little bit about those in a second. Um, but really, like vaguely, I just listed some responsibilities as a lab tech because I think technician overall, you can't just imagine what I do day in and day out. Um, so there's just some things there. Um, I mostly do um, all the maintaining of mosquito colonies. So it's similar to what I was doing with crickets. And there's actually a big aspect of the job when I was looking for a position. Um, so that seemed to fit with, you know, my credentials. Um, I also provide research support for various projects because um, being in the lab is kind of chaotic. We sometimes have like four projects going on at once. We have to like devote different times of days to those projects. 
Um, I also collect and maintain de data records. Um, I write standard operating procedures while also adhering to like, safety policies and guidelines. Uh, these are just some things. There's plenty of other um, small things that I could be missing right now. I'm sure Erica could weigh in on it later. <laughs> um, Erica works right next to me um, at the USDA, so we're part of the same department. All right. Um, so coming from crickets to mosquitoes, I feel like I don't have to really necessarily tell you why we're interested in researching mosquitoes, because um, it's pretty well known that they're a global health concern. Um, so they're vectors for various diseases, which means that they will bite like a host, um, which could be like a bird, for example, and then they will pick up a disease uh, like yellow fever, um, West Nile virus is something that's common in um, America but they will then bite humans and they will transmit this virus to humans uh, and then we become sick. And then there's just some facts down there um, about how mosquitoes cause multiple deaths per year. So it's, pretty, um, it's a pretty important topic to be researching. Um, and also at the USDA, I feel like it's important to share that mosquitoes can also decrease productivity in livestock, uh, which is really important because that indirectly affects us too uh, through animal agriculture. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how I maintain all my mosquitoes because um, I think it's kind of fun and it's way more involved than when I was rearing crickets. Uh, but first, I just wanted to like briefly introduce that mosquitoes go through complete metamorphosis, which means that they have four distinct life stages. And you can see that in this image here. Um, so they start off as eggs. Um, females will lay, they're called egg rafts. They'll lay them on top of the water and they can lay up to like 100 eggs at a time. Um, these eggs will, they can hatch within a few days or they can stay dormant um, for up to six months, which is really interesting. Uh, but basically, as soon as the eggs are um, submerged in water, so if there's like a rainfall or if like there's like disturbance in the water, then the larvae, which is the next form of life, the next life stage, um, they will emerge from the egg. And then this lasts for a few days, up to five days maybe, and then they turn into pupae. Uh, pupae will usually like rest right at the water. Um, in a lot of insect life cycles, um, pupae are uh, like an inactive stage, but that's not true for mosquitoes. They are very active. So if you disturb the water, they'll just go scattering and swim around everywhere. Um, and then after being a uh, pupa for a couple days, they'll emerge out of the water as an adult. And my job, uh, a lot of my time for my job is spent taking care of mosquitoes during all these different life stages. Okay. So I have a little schematic of how I take care of mosquitoes. Um, so on the left-hand side, you'll see that I have different um, rows and I have life stages, which eggs, uh, larvae and pupae. And then I have my rearing practice, which just give you a little description on how I take care of them. And then I also included the lab equipment that we use because um, before I started doing research, I would always think of science as like really shiny equipment. And while that's true, like we have really expensive and nice equipment in our lab, a lot of the equipment we do use is just like common household items. Um, so you can see right down here, like a larval tray is actually just like a really shallow bin and it can, that can, you know, serve its purpose. Um, larvae, can, or sorry, females will also lay eggs like in the wild in like buckets outside, like old tires sitting around in ponds. So really anything that has like a shallow water, water surface. And then our adult cages are um, gallon ice cream buckets that we just modify. So it's, um, you know, not the most glamorous stuff, but it makes it really easy to rear some mosquitoes. <laughs> So at first, with the eggs, if you start at the beginning of the life cycle, uh, we will put eggs in this desiccator. And desiccator is just a really fancy word for kind of piece of equipment that like dries things out. So I told you that eggs, once they're submerged in water, they will, um, the larvae will hatch out of them. So that's true. We put eggs inside this tiny little box with a little bit of water and we place it inside the desiccator that's there. And then we hook it up to a vacuum and this will like increase the pressure which also helps them hatch out of the eggs way faster. So this only takes maybe like 15 minutes. I just leave the eggs in there. And then when you're done, you have really teeny tiny larvae, um, which brings me to the next life stage. 
So the larvae are pictured here and you can kind of see that there's different stages of larvae. They have, I think it's five different molts of larvae, which is almost like a new molt every single day. So they just pro progressively get bigger. So you can see kind of like a tiny one right here and then there's a bigger one over here. So they're little different um, life points. Um, but basically to take care of larvae, I just put them in the larval tray, which again is that shallow bin, and I put a little bit of water in there and I place some like fish food and rabbit food in there three times a week and they're pretty happy with that. And then after like five to seven days, they'll turn into pupae, which uh, I said they'll like collect near the top of the water. Um, they will, they'll, st they'll stay there for, I think it's like two to three days before they turn into adults. Um, but right before they turn into adults, I will use a turkey baster, which I don't know if anybody knows what that is, but it's just something that you use to collect liquid. I'll just take a turkey baster and I'll collect all the pupae and there's usually like 400 of them. So I just like suck them all up <laughs> with a couple tries, put it in this tiny little cup and then I'll put it inside this adult cage, which the adult cage you'll see in a later photo, it's modified to have like a hole at the top, which, which has like a mesh screen um, so that they can um, blood feed later and they, you know, they have like transfer of air. And then in the front is another hole that we cut into it and there's a nylon sleeve that we just tie with a knot. And um, I will just stick my hand into this nylon sleeve with a glove on uh, when there's a bunch of adults in there if I need to move anything around for any reason. All right, so once I put the pupae um, in that little cup inside the adult cage, um, it only takes a couple of days and then you have like almost like 300 adults will emerge because not everybody will survive to adulthood, but a lot of them usually do. So you have males and females hanging out in there and we keep them adults for about a week and we just feed them sugar water because that's, you know, kind of similar to what they would drink um, out in nature, which is, you know, similar to like nectar. Um, and then when the females are ready, uh, we will blood feed them because only females are the ones that are biting you. Uh, males don't bite at all. They're just there to mate with the females. <laughs> and females only bite you um, because they need the blood meal to nourish their eggs before they lay them. Um, so I think one of the coolest things I found about this job was blood feeding them because it's something so unlike anything I've ever done before. Um, we basically will just order cow blood and we just keep it in the lab. And when we're ready, we will use it to feed the females. Um, and we'll use blood feeders down here, which I have a bigger image to show you. So if you imagine this to be the adult cage, and this is the mesh screen that I said is on top, uh, you put the blood feeder, which is this contraption right here on top of it, and you secure it really tightly so that this, it's like a flat circular surface. Um, it's gonna be pressed up against the mesh screen. And you have all of the females down here. Um, and they're really hungry, so they know, they know what's coming. And also, if they're being kind of picky, I will take parafilm and I'll rub it on my skin so that they can smell that something's coming. And they're usually pretty attracted to that, and they'll eat it up right. It'll eat it right up. So you have parafilm hill here, and then you have an inlet and outlet source, which is just water that's going around the blood source. Um, and that's because you want the blood to be warm because that makes a huge difference for um, feeding behavior and mosquitoes. And then I will just put blood in here. It doesn't take much, just a little bit. The blood will collect down here. And then the parafilm on the bottom is like really thin. So the females will come up to the surface and they'll pierce the parafilm kind of like as if they're piercing skin of a mammal. And then they'll feed on the blood and it doesn't take very long. They eat it all up in maybe like an hour. Uh, but I thought that was the coolest part of rearing mosquitoes. So shortly after females, um, blood feed, they will lay their eggs and they're not very picky. They'll just lay it on like a piece of paper if I put it in there, it's like kind of damp. They'll lay it right there. And then after a day or two, I'll just re reach my hand in and take all the eggs out. And then you use those next eggs for the next generation. All right, so we keep mosquitoes around because we have a bunch of different projects we're doing. Um, but one of the most exciting projects that we've been working on, I think is, um, using insect pathogens to develop uh, biopesticide, biopesticide against mosquitoes. So basically, in a nutshell, I take a bunch of different fungal strains and I will apply them to mosquitoes 
or I'll put it in their food and I measure their survival to see if it's killing them or not. Because the goal is to use this as a pesticide instead of um, commercial pesticides because mosquitoes are developing resistance to those and they're pretty harsh on other um, animals, like beneficial animals like Erica was talking about. Um, so this is our aim. And we, like I said, we will feed mosquitoes. We'll either, um, we'll make different doses of um, fungal colonies and we'll put them into their food, which is usually sugar water, um, or we can like topically apply them to the mosquito too so that we know that they're directly uh, applied. And then we also do this at different life stages. So we do this at the larval pupil and adult stages. Um, so here is some results. Uh, this is a not too complicated, I'm just gonna have you focus on this guy right here. This is a pretty good graph um, that shows you that fungal pathogens will reduce mosquito longevity, which is just a fancy way of saying that uh, the fungus that we're using in our lab is killing the mosquitoes. And so we're kind of, um, kind of reaching our goal. Uh, so the different colors mean different doses and red is the highest dose. Uh, so that's um, the amount of spores that are in a, I believe it's a microliter. And then you have the percent survival, which is how many individuals are surviving on the y-axis, and you have days post-infection on the x-axis. And you can tell just from the highest dose that um, it's pretty effective and it's killing like a little less than, or a little more than 40% uh, just by like the fourth day, which is definitely out-competing with the rest of the fungal strains here. So this is a fungal strain that we're really interested in, um, but we're also interested in combining the fungal strains together because sometimes microbes can act together um, <clears throat> and they can have really interesting effects uh, rather than be alone. All right, so these are some really um, cool pictures. It's basically just when we, um, uh, I'm not, I don't know for sure if we fed the, mos the mosquitoes the fungal strains or if they were topically applied, but basically all of this fuzzy stuff is um, fungal spores in conidia. Um, and these are obviously mosquito cadavers, meaning that they're dead, but uh, they're very pretty to look at. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's just really interesting. You can see all the different characteristics of the different fungal strains that we use in our lab. All the same outcome though. <laughs> All right, and then in the future, um, I kind of already like hinted at this, but we're just gonna combine the different fungal strains. We were actually doing this in the lab right before we had to start teleworking. Um, so that was pretty easy. We just like measured different amounts of different fungal strains and we just randomly paired them together. So we had like a fully reciprocal design, um, but then we just put it in their sugar water and we stuck 10 mosquitoes in like a little cup and let them feed on the water. And then I just went in every day and I measured whether or not they were still alive and how many of them, the proportion of them were still alive. All right, and so that's all I really have for you, except for I just wanted to add on to what um, Eric said earlier, is that anyone could be a scientist. Um, I taught a couple sections of Biology 101 at Illinois State University, and it's amazing to hear that people think that they don't have the use for science in their life when actually you use it all the time every day. Um, science is as simple as you know asking questions, uh, making observations, predictions. Um, if you're really curious, you can just test those predictions and answer those questions and you can share your results, uh, which is what I'm really excited to do and that's why I really love research. Um, but yeah, that's basically it. And if you have any questions, here's my email. So you can always reach out to me. Um, I'd love to be a mentor to anybody. I had plenty of mentors. Uh, Kristen was a mentor to me. She was great. Um, so yeah, just let me know if you have any questions and I'd be happy to answer them. And thank you all for listening. Kelly, you do have a couple um, comments and questions in the chat. So some, Audrey said her sister got bit by an infected mosquito. So she's probably excited about the research that you're okay. doing. Um, there were some comments about um, mosquitoes in, in standing water, um, but May has a question about, um, I understand there's a new mosquito in Illinois that feeds during the daytime. Do you test different kinds of mosquitoes? Um, so I haven't heard about the new mosquito in Illinois, uh, but we work with two main species of mosquitoes. So that's Aedes aegypti, um, and then that's Aedes albopictus. And I think aegypti can be 
found around here. Um, I'm pretty sure like a past tech and a good friend of all of ours um, is Molly. And I think she went out and she collected mosquitoes from a graveyard that's right across from USDA, which is kind of spooky, but kind of cool. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so that's just the two species we work with and I haven't heard of the new one, but that'd be interesting to look into. Excuse me, but why do mosquito bites itch? Um, that's a good question. So when mosquitoes bite you, uh, they do it, they apply like a, an anesthetic with their saliva. So you can't really feel them there, but the anesthetic is what makes your body react to it. So not everybody reacts to mosquito bites, but some people do. And that's just kind of like an allergic reaction almost, uh, which is similar to like a hive if you ever had one. So it's just really itchy for a few days afterwards because your body was trying to fend it off. <laughs> the mosquitoes put that in anyway? Um, they put it in because they wouldn't be very good at biting you if you could feel it, right? I know if I see a mosquito on me, I'm going to slap it away and I'm done with it. <laughs> uh, but they're sneaky and they need that saliva to be successful in uh, obtaining their blood meals. I heard that they put um, it in because it thins out the blood. Is that true? Um, I don't know actually, but I don't see why not if it kind of act as an anticoagulant to like help them take up some blood. Yeah, I couldn't, I've only been working with them since the end of January, so they're pretty new to me, but um, I'm gonna look into that. Thank you, Robin. <laughs> you have one other question in the chat box, although I dislike getting bit, would bats die if we killed all the mosquitoes? Would bats die? Mm-hmm. I don't think so because bats, well, I guess it depends on what bat it is. And I have zero experience of bats, but I know that um, bats will prey on insects, like nocturnal insects, like moths. Um, so yeah, I guess mosquitoes would also kind of be nocturnal if they're kind of at sunset. Um, I don't think they would die. They'd probably switch to a different insect or they're probably not super specialized in just mosquitoes and dieting on those. <clears throat> I certainly hope not. Bats are pretty cool, but <laughs> I wouldn't want to see them go. <laughs> Okay, super. Any other questions for Kylie? Um, do more people get mosquito bites than others? Yes, they do. Um, and there is like, a ton of explanations for why that is. Um, but some really common ones are um, they're attracted to dark colors. So if you're wearing dark colors, and that's because they have pretty poor eyesight. Um, so it's easy for them to find dark colors, so like shadows and stuff. Um, another one is sweat because you have um, lactic acid in your sweat and they can pick up on that scent. Um, and so they're really attracted to it. Another one is carbon dioxide. So that's what you exhale. So you take an oxygen and you breathe out carbon dioxide. They'll pick up on that cue too and they'll come after you. Um, and then there's like, uh, I think it's like 400 chemicals. Um, like volatile chemicals that they can pick up on your skin too. Um, but it's not too certain, like which of those they're really interested in. Uh, so that's, you know, obviously a really big area of research because everyone has that question. Uh, they're also, um, they also have preference for blood type too. Does it matter what type of blood type you have or anything that's in your blood? Um, I would say so, but I don't research that, so I couldn't honestly answer that confidently. <laughs> Hope that's okay. Great. Well, you got lots of good questions, Kyle. So thanks for um, answering those. We're going to switch over to Kristen to give her a few minutes to talk about her path and what she does, and then we'll have a few last minutes um, for general questions. So, Kristen, you're up. Hi, thanks everyone. But, um, I thought I'd give you all a different perspective or a different kind of career trajectory than uh, than Erica and Kylie because we're all we're all so different. And so here's just another perspective. Razzle dazzle personality will <laughs> have to do. So, um, so as I said, my name is Kristen. I uh, started uh, my path to being a scientist uh, not terribly long ago. Um, so when I graduated high school. Um, I should say during high school, I was really interested in art and design and I did like okay in my science classes, but I just was not, that was just never on my 
list of interests of things that I wanted to do that I thought I would do. So I actually went, started college um, pursuing a, a career in design and um, it was fine. I liked it okay, but I took a, um, an elective class in just general biology and I was just like blown away with what I was learning. It was just, just so, it just gripped me. I was so interested in, in learning everything I could about genetics and evolution and animal behavior, all kinds of things like that. I was super interested, so much so that I actually changed my major um, and wanted to pursue biology, still not knowing exactly what, I, was, I still wasn't thinking about my career, just as an academic pursuit, I thought biology was, was just really fascinating. Um, and so I, I transferred, I, I started at a different university. I transferred to, to Illinois State University, which is where Kylie went also. And that's in normal Illinois, which is where I live currently. Um, but um, still, so I, so I didn't really know what I was gonna do with that. I thought, well, if I'm a biology major, then I'll probably just like go into medicine because that's what I thought everyone did if you just go into medicine. So I thought, I pursued that a little bit, uh, realized quickly that that, that wasn't for me. Um, because needles and like blood like kind of freaked me out. So that wasn't going to work out. But um, at the, about that same time, I got um, asked to do some research in a lab. Um, so kind of what Kylie was talking about to, um, to volunteer to work as a, like a helper, a undergraduate research helper in a lab. Um, and I actually started working in a lab with turtles. So these uh, red-eared slider turtles, which I think you can get at like Petco. They're also an invasive species here, so you can kind of go to lakes and stuff and find them. Um, but just really briefly, I worked with uh, steroid metabolism in turtles. Um, so I did that, and that's kind of what really um, showed me that, that I could have a career doing research. Like, I didn't know that that was even a possibility. Um, and I just really loved it. I loved, like, taking really detailed notes and keeping a lab notebook and asking these questions and I just thought I was just totally into it. So um, when it was time to graduate, it's like, well, what, what do I do now? And I, and I learned that, well, I could go to, I could keep learning. I could go to graduate school. And I was just all about that, you know, like let's delay getting a job going into the real world. I could just keep going. I could just stay in school and, and go to graduate school. So I originally pursued a master's. So if you're unfamiliar, master's is typically for biology. It's typically can be done in one to three years. It's typically usually closer to two years. So I was like, okay, I can, I can commit to, you know, two to three years. Um, so I started that, I, I, but I switched um, research focus a, a little bit. And I, I was very interested in um, studying animal behavior. So why do animals do what they do? Um, how do they interact in their environment to, to get what they need? Um, so uh, I switched. So I switched focus and instead of doing turtles because turtles they I'm sure they're very interesting and wonderful, but they don't like do <laughs> a lot of stuff that I found very interesting. Um, uh, so I, I switched to working with insects. So this is I was kind of in the same boat as Kylie is. Like if you told me that I would be working with insects, I'd be like, no way. I was I was not really one to be playing with insects, but so I, was, I started in a lab that really focused on um, what's called behavioral ecology, so understanding the behavior of crickets, um, not because we like love crickets, um, it's just because they're a really good animal to study very basic behaviors with. They don't live very long, they're cheap, they, um, we can keep thousands of crickets in the lab. We can do all kinds of stuff to them, manipulate them in ways. We don't have to get like approval from, you know, higher ups that we're not like abusing animals or anything because they're just insects, right? So we kind of do whatever we want with them. So um, briefly, my, my research focus there was to, to look at um, how these insects respond to infection with their behavior. So how, can they, how do they alter kind of what they do when they're infected, when they're sick? So um, I don't know if I'm rambling, I have this, my PowerPoint to keep me on topic, but um, so I started with a master's, loved it, decided instead of doing a master's, I actually want to do a PhD, which in biology, it ranges, but it's typically four to six years, seven, seven years to do. So um, just for your reference, my PhD uh, took me, my, to finish my dissertation took me about six years. So that's 
a long time staying in staying in school and um, but during that time you know it's not just doing research as a graduate student you're I was also taking classes and uh, teaching also so I got just tons of experience to um, to prepare me for kind of where I am now um, so graduated in 2018 with my PhD um, and then following that I did what's called a, a postdoc or postdoctoral research appointment and um, that's kind of unique to, to certain fields, so not everyone's familiar with that. But basically, I, I kind of describe it to non-science folk as kind of like an apprenticeship, right? So I've graduated with my PhD, not quite, quite ready to, to, to like lead my own lab yet, because it just takes so many years of, of training. So a postdoc is kind of this middle transition period where I have my PhD, but um, I'm kind of getting ready to, to be a bit more independent. So I did a postdoc appointment at ISU where I graduated from, uh, still working with crickets, kind of doing behavior, evolution, ecology, immunology stuff. Uh, I'll just leave it for that. If you have more questions about the specifics, let me know. But, um, but then, um, so just recently in February of this year, um, that appointment ended and I actually started a, a new postdoc at the USDA. So I work with Erica and Kylie. Um, and now I do much more applied work. So uh, I won't go into too much detail because Erica touched on it very well, but essentially I'm helping to develop and improve these biopesticides that target agriculture pests. So working with viruses and fungus and even some bacteria now. Um, so that's super fun. Um, I really like it. The other thing I wanted to touch on about kind of to describe kind of my career is something that I, what I, why I love being a scientist and why I, I just think it's so fun. And, and one of the, the things is that I get to do a whole bunch of stuff. So sometimes you think biologists and it's like very narrow, but in fact, I, I get to do all kinds of things. So I dabble in entomology. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a cat. I'm gonna... <laughs> um, I start talking and then my cat wants to join. But so I, I dabble in entomology, which is a study of insects, as Erica said. I do ethology, which is a study of behavior, microbiology, evolutionary biology. I'm learning some molecular techniques. Um, and I, so I'm just constantly learning, which I, I love. I love getting to learn new techniques. And some, some days I feel like I'm just like playing around in the lab and, and then I'm like, oh yeah, this is my job. I get, this is what I get to do. So um, I think that's all I really wanted to say. I didn't want to talk too long. So I'm happy to take any questions. Um, thanks for having me. This is good, cool, a cool um, series. So. Great, well, thank you. Does anybody have questions? There's one in the chat box says the Ag Lab still give tours. Outside of COVID times, I think, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so, um... Typically, we give tours. So, what would happen is, so in in non-pandemic time, um, we had an uh, outreach committee. So, in, in all of our outreach is, is on a volunteer basis at the lab. So, there's there's no there's no person that's that's that it's their job to organize these things. So, it's all volunteers. Um, you would reach out to the outreach committee and um, talk of, tell, uh, typically it's groups so you, you would identify what group you were with how many people you wanted to bring um, right now we're not even we're barely allowed in the building so we're definitely not doing tours at this time um, so just keep uh, just just reach out so if you if you reach so right now I'm the outreach coordinator you reach out to me um, I can put you on my list of people that are interested and I, I, I will keep in contact with those people who express interest well I just want to say thank you again to all of our speakers and um, several things that you said I thought were so um, important for the girls to hear and everybody who's a not just girls, um, but um, what Erica said about be a scientist where you are with what you have. I think especially right now when everybody's kind of stuck at home, um, I think that's so great. Like just go explore your backyard or um, inside, you know, find things that you can ask questions about and 
um, just be a scientist. I love that. And the other thing that I think was really important, I, I don't know if everyone noticed this, but I feel like each of the speakers in some way or another talked about mentorship or volunteering or being a helper in a lab. Um, so all of those things, I think, are a great opportunity to um, find out what you enjoy doing. Um, Kristen said, pay attention to what excites you. You know, even when she was talking, you could see her get excited when she talked about um, her biology class. So pay attention to those things and what um, excites you, because I think that will help you know what, um, what you like to do. So thank you everyone for being with us today. And thank you speaker. You are a great way to end our series. So thank you so much everybody for being with us. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.